Oh, that's amazing. Okay, episode 20, this is a big one. If you've been following along, you may remember that among other parts never intended for this car, like a Corvette rear end and Crown Victoria front suspension, our little Triumph is also getting a 5.3 liter all aluminum LS4 V8 from a Pontiac and a T5 five-speed manual gearbox from a Mustang. If that sounds like a hodgepodge, you're absolutely right. We would have loved to use something more convenient like an LS1 and T56, but honestly, those transmissions are massive. And, well, we've come to find that Monopoly money doesn't actually hold any trade value in the real world. In other words, this was by far the cheapest way I could find to get an all aluminum LS, car style intake manifold, and a manual gearbox. So why you ask, isn't it used all the time then? Well, of course there's a catch. Though similar in many ways to the coveted LS6, the LS4 was designed specifically for front wheel drive cars and therefore is lacking a few minorly critical features that are needed for a rear wheel drive application, making it essentially useless. So today in blind stubbornness, we're going to ignore that and make it work anyway. So subscribe and hit the bell. We'd also really appreciate it if you could tell some friends about the project. So far, we've restored the body, built an entirely new frame, and last time completed the fabrication of a custom anti-roll bar, which we got some great feedback on. Now, truth be told, I don't really know if this will be suitable in the long run. We tried our best, but it is a placeholder at the very least, and we can always reassess things when the car eventually makes it to the roads. While we're on the subject of the last episode, though, let's just quickly take a moment to clear up a couple of my bads. An anti-roll bar increases the load on the outside tire under cornering, not decreases. And likewise, the stress for strain definitions were also completely backwards. Stress is the force, and strain is the strength, effectively. I'm going to blame these on too many late nights, though even now, I'm still honestly a bit baffled by this one. That dip really throws me for a loop. Apparently, there are even multiple versions of this graph, so if you want to know more, I'd suggest that you just Google it. Moving on. We covered the LS4 in some detail back in episode 10, but to summarize, it has three main issues. The first being its bell housing bolt pattern. This is what's known in the GM world as the 60 degree or metric or small corporate pattern. And although no other small block based engine has ever used it, it has been utilized on many V6s, the North Star V8, and even some four cylinders. So after a lot of reading, we decided to go with a used bell housing from a 1983 through 86 Jeep CJ equipped with a 2.5 liter AMC four cylinder engine. It not only fits our engine perfectly and keeps the starter motor bump on the usual side, but it also incorporates the Ford style bolt pattern for our T5 gearbox. So that's what I'd call a win. These 60 degree bell housings are a little smaller than what's normally behind an LS, which actually aids fitment in our tiny little car. But the problem is there's actually less room inside them for a clutch and flywheel. And as we shrink a flywheel, so do we also our chances of meshing a starter motor with it, which leads us on to our next problem. Mounting a starter will be difficult as there is no mount. To make matters worse, the LS4 only ever came paired to an automatic gearbox, meaning there are no off-the-shelf flywheels available, and thus nothing to even aim a starter at. Put simply, this is a quandary, and it's why the LS4 is at least hardly ever used in a rear-wheel drive setup. So why on earth are we messing around with this? Well, as it happens, over a year ago, I came upon a thread from Scott Costanzo on the British V8 forums. He put an LS4 and T5 into his MGB and documented the whole thing very nicely. Scott, if you're watching, I blame you for all this, but thank you. We wouldn't be where we are if it wasn't for your efforts, and I hope you like our take on the design. As it happens, this assortment of parts should get us on our way. We've got the original flex plate from the LS4, which will serve as a reference for the crank bolt pattern and center bore size. 
a performance clutch intended for an 80s Mustang or Thunderbird with a 2.3 liter turbo, which yes, is rated for our power level. And lastly, a flywheel from a 1985 Chevy S10 pickup with a 2.8 liter V6, which we're not going to use as it doesn't actually fit. It will, however, help us in a few ways, starting with its ring gear. This is a 148 tooth gear, down from the 168 normally seen on an LS, but up from the 142 on the original flex plate. This is a critical point. Its diameter is still small enough to fit in our bell housing, but absolutely as large as possible to give us a chance of meshing a starter motor with it. More on that to come. It's just an interference fit on the flywheel, so by heating it up, it should expand and fall right off. Theoretically. I think this would have been a bit easier if we had anything better than a propane blowtorch, but hey, you use what you got, right? Here you go. Now we're no strangers to what we call the poor man's milling machine, otherwise known as the angle grinder. We own several, and along with a drill and a welder, that's pretty much all we've used to build the car so far. So, naturally, when it came to building a custom flywheel, we're not that stupid. After giving us a swift whack upside the head, our friend Henry carefully nibbled away a piece of 1045 billet steel in a lathe until it took the shape of this shiny new flywheel. It still needs balancing, but it gets us well and truly on our way. It has the typical LS crankshaft bolt pattern, the 9-inch Ford clutch pattern and associated dowel pins, and the remaining dimensions were taken directly from that S10 flywheel. Hence why we bought it. We needed the exact dimensions. To save you from doing the same thing, here's a drawing of the design, on the perhaps remote chance that you want to give this a shot yourself. Looks like the pressure plate mates up properly, so, so far, so good. I guess the real question is, does it fit the engine? Nice! <laughs> Who'd have thought a CNC machine was more accurate than my eyeballs and an angle grinder? To get the ring gear installed, we gave it a clean and popped it in the oven for a bit. We prefer our ring gears baked, not fried. 250 degree oven. We're able to gently persuade that on with a hammer. Everything looks good. Since the flywheel was frozen, it's got a nice layer of frost all over top of it. So we've actually just put it back in the oven with the oven off just to sort of more slowly bring it up to temperature here. And then we can wipe off any of the moisture so it doesn't hopefully flash rust. So with minimal hair pulling, that is one new beautiful custom flywheel complete with ring gear. And with a light oil to keep it from rusting, this is really a huge step towards making things work. To be honest, having a friend with a machine shop has helped, but still wasn't free. And if you're looking at this going, well, there goes any hope of this being a cost-effective solution, that's really not true. There's likely an experienced shop near you who'd be willing to take this on. And even if there isn't, there's plenty of companies online who specialize in custom flywheels. So in the long run, if you end up paying around 450 US, you're actually doing very well. One of our targets has been to put together an entire LS4 and T5 package with as quality of parts as possible for about the same as you can buy just an LS1, which is typically about two grand. Now, is that an unrealistic target? No, actually, I, I think we'd be pretty close. Okay, let's change gears for a bit. On the transmission side of things, it's not exactly cut and dry either. Our Tremec T5 from a 2004 Mustang V6 is a great unit, but unfortunately it complicates life by having the longest input shaft of any other T5 ever made. So short of a custom spacer, swapping the input shaft over or machining the one we've got, that's another factor we have to work around. As it turns out, we didn't like any of those options. So here's the first part of our solution. These are input shaft bearing retainers, the part which lives here. This is the factory Ford one, and this is a new one I found online. I believe it's what Chevy put on the S10s. 
It is all steel, which is an upgrade in itself, but the main reason we got it is for the much shorter profile here, which will give us more room for a release bearing. There are a number of different parts in the mix here, so rather than just throwing a lot of words out there, let's just take a quick overview of what's actually going on. We have an engine, a flywheel, which bolts to the crankshaft of the engine, a friction disc, a pressure plate, release bearing, associated releasing mechanisms, and of course the transmission with its input shaft, which rides in a pilot bearing in the back of the crankshaft. Sounds like a lot, but there's really only two moving parts. The friction disc is splined to the transmission's input shaft, and always spins with it. The pressure plate is fixed to the flywheel, and always spins with the engine. When your foot is off the clutch pedal, springs in the pressure plate clamp down on the friction disc, causing everything to move in unison. When you depress the clutch pedal, though, a mechanism will force the release bearing to move, depressing fingers on the pressure plate, and allowing the engine and transmission to spin at different speeds. Now, because of our hodgepodge of parts, it may seem easiest just to use the release bearing, fork, and external slave cylinder from the Jeep that our bell housing came out of. But we only have so much room in our bell housing between the flywheel and transmission, and there is no guarantee that the Jeep parts will fit with the rest of what we've got going on. So, a little bit hard on the wallet, we decided to pull the trigger on this beautiful hydraulic throwout bearing conversion kit, as it is adjustable, compact, and perhaps most of all, very, very simple, which sounds pretty appealing right now. This design is also referred to as a concentric slave, as it eliminates the fork and external slave cylinder by packaging everything into one tidy little unit. And as we mentioned before, the new steel bearing retainer is shorter, so we've now got plenty of room to make things fit properly. Here it is mounted up to the transmission. And hold on. What is that thing? Oh yeah, our newest member of the team has arrived. Welcome aboard, Mr. PowerTig185DV. Yep, it would have been great to have it sooner, but I finally decided it was time to get a TIG. I have no affiliation with Everlast, but after months of research, this was the best bang for the buck all-rounder I could find, and I'm really looking forward to playing with it. We've even been able to modify our welder cart to accept a second unit, and yeah, it'll need some further tweaking once we pick up a bottle of argon, but at least it gets things somewhat more contained, as we don't exactly have the room to spread things out in here. Back to the transmission, though. We did have to get the outer diameter of the new retainer turned down a little bit to fit in our bell housing, but with that done, it now all fits up perfectly, and I'm almost sad that we're never going to see this when all is said and done. Tell me, has anyone ever made a glass bell housing before? Before we can just slam it all together though, we do need to do some further measuring, which requires the bell housing to be swapped back over yet again. However, for some reason this time, I was aware that it doesn't fully sit flush to the engine until you torque it down. I don't know if we've just been forcing it all this time, but I'd rather not have any interference if we can help it. So let's just trim down those alignment dials a bit and see if it helps. Ah, much better. So right now we're setting up the throwout bearings position on the transmission. This needs about an eighth of an inch gap between the face here and the face of the fingers on the pressure plate. Uh, the way to know if you have that gap or not is to have your bell housing bolted up to your engine and we'll measure from the tip of one of the fingers to the back surface here. So use a ruler, uh, get it nice and square across and then subtract the length of the ruler. You then wanna look from that corresponding mating surface on the transmission, which would be right there, and check in line with the face of your throwout bearing. What you want to see is this dimension smaller than this dimension that you took over here. When I put this together, it was quite a bit smaller, so I stacked in a few shims on the back here, which came with the throwout bearing kit. And when I check along there, that's that eighth of an inch that we need. So basically this is all set up. So when we slide that in there, there'll be a little gap. And then when you start pushing on the clutch pedal, this will come out 
and release your clutch, and then you can change gears or sit and with your foot on the clutch pedal for some reason. With the bell housing in place, we got a unique opportunity to see just how much room there is for our clutch and flywheel, and I'm happy to report all is well. This is how little of the flywheel actually hangs out the side of the block. And it's going to be a bit of fun to imagine a starter engaging with that, but we're going to give it our best shot. The LS4 is an interesting one. It only ever was attached to a fairly heavy-duty automatic transmission in uh, the front-wheel drive platforms that it came out of. And in those platforms, the starter motor actually mounted to the transmission, not to the engine. So there is no traditional starter mount down here like every single other LS engine that's ever been produced. Our transmission does not have a spot for a starter motor. And even if it did, it probably wouldn't be the right starter to turn this over. So we need something a little bit more custom. And what the solution is, is one of these little guys. So this is a gear reduction starter where the, gear, the motor is over here and then it's got a gear drive that takes it down to the side before it goes out to the pinion. And this is for small and big block Chevy engines. What we're probably going to end up having to do is modify this block here as pretty much this whole side needs to get cut off and we might have to make a little notch up in here. This little part on the end here can come off. So this is modifiable. You can now get an idea of how, with this up next to the V of the engine block, it's kicked that gear off to the side. So the plan is that we can make enough room down in this real estate to actually engage right there. There's a little boss on the side of the engine that's going to need to come off, but we should be in the right vicinity to get that little guy going. After fiddling around with some cardboard templates for probably too long, we could get on with cutting some steel plate for the actual mounting bracket. The starter bracket is fitting up nicely and clears the flywheel easily, however things are a bit harder to see now, so here's a slightly more manageable cardboard flywheel for test fitting. The aluminum block from the starter motor needs to live somewhere back in here, but it first is going to require some modifying, so it's out with a grinder again. So now, with everything fitting very nicely, the smooth side goes up against there and this sets up, sits up against the block quite nicely and there's a little bit of wiggle that we could have up and down. What we actually did was we shoved it up as high as it could possibly go and drew around the inside with a marker, found the center of that and then based off this line here and this line here we were able to actually transfer it over to this side and mark it out. This line here was almost the bottom of one of the teeth on the flywheel and by measuring from the center of that to over there, we get an idea of our gear mesh uh, when we compare it to the pinion on the actual starter motor. And we think we're going to be pretty good. Now it doesn't really want to work at all. 
We got it. How long is this? <laughs> Four minutes and 47 seconds. Hey. There, that sounds interesting. Ooh, there's wood. There you go. So we've got that whole board out. It was one and, what was it? One and a three quarter? Yep. Something like that, yeah. And what we're left with is that. A really nice tight fit there. Holy cow, it's almost perfect. I think it could come just a hair tighter. That means we have to go to... up? Yes. There was about a perfect three eighths of an inch step in between the back of the metal and the engine here and the face of the bell housing. So we've used 3 16th inch metal in one layer so far. And then what this cardboard here is marking out is a second layer of 3 16th metal. The reason why we use 3 16th inch material instead of just filling in the 3 8th hole with 3 8th material is because currently this is flush across. The oil pan actually protrudes a little bit past this surface here. And now it's just slightly behind the face of this by about 3 16ths of an inch. So by stacking another layer on top of this, we're now taking up that 3 8ths of an inch. And then by coming up into here, we're filling off what would have been a little hole, and another little hole, and potentially another little hole. And then this whole piece will have these two bolts, and then several bolts along there, plus an additional one here through the bell housing, all helping to hold it on, which at the end of the day is sealing out dust, but also giving us a really beefy mount for the starter motor to attach to. With that larger template now transferred to steel, it too can be cut out, and we've even pre-drilled some plug weld holes in anticipation of the next step. We may come back later and weld up the side as well, but this gets us off to a really nice start. Again, you use the tool you've got. Look at that. It's almost like we knew what we were doing. So typically, this block is solid through here, and this is actually a threaded hole, but we've drilled it out all the way and picked up some longer bolts. There's a few extra holes on the back here, and we're going to pick off this one, and we might stick another one in uh, somewhere around that kind of area. So then we'll have those four bolts coming straight through from the back, and all of those are actually accessible from the outside. So even with the engine in the car, starter, everything like that, we can actually get all four of those removed and pull the starter out without having to yank the engine transmission, separate the transmission, all that fun stuff. This is the one where we put that helicoil on the bottom. So we're going to have the angle iron for it. That sharpie line there is roughly where we're going to trim this off to mate it up with the rest of the bell housing shape. And uh, we're on the right direction. So we've got the flywheel back on. We've got the starter motor mounted. I've got the pinion pulled all the way out and shimmed. You can see the engagement here is nearly all the way flush. It's pretty perfect actually. When I pull this out, you can see it pops back in. We've actually got clearance through there, so it's not engaged at all. But that should be what we're aiming for. And then the beauty of having it all clamped together right now is we can take the flywheel back off, undo the bolts holding this steel plate on. The starter motor is actually being held on by its two original bolts right now. So we can take it all off as a unit, remove those two bolts, take the starter out, and the block will still be clamped to our new plate. So then we can just drill from the back, get them perfectly aligned, and then tap the plate out. That pretty much takes care of that. The only last thing that we're going to do to really beef it up just a little bit more is this shelf from the bottom, which is just another piece of 8 inch angle iron. We've also got a little shim here, and the idea is if we start with the shim, and then weld this, blo this uh, block on. When we go to tighten up the bolt, that will hold this in a certain location. And if we then pull the shim out and tighten the bolt up, that will have actually pulled the starter down a little bit, loosening the gear mesh. 
And if we add in another shim and then do the bolt up, that'll sort of push the starter up a hair. There's not a lot of slot because literally it's just the holes where these long bolts are going through that's actually going to have a wiggle to it. So we're not talking about much, but these shims also aren't that thick. So hopefully we've got a little bit of play. And that's really the last part of the starter mount. So this is the reason why people don't bother with the LS4, this and the flywheel. And it's been a little bit of fun, but not too bad. And I think we've got something that's going to work. That looks pretty stealthy, if I do say so myself. I like how it doesn't just jump out and scream, I'm custom. It just looks like it's supposed to be this way. And that's exactly what I was aiming for. Starter motor's on there, finalized, done. Everything's perfect. We shave down the side here so it sort of follows the shape of the bell housing. Everything tucks within the bell housing. Nothing really protrudes at all past the motor. The solenoid is so stinking tight up through here, but it actually still clears. You can get a piece of cardboard in behind it. This little guy here is threaded into the steel plate to help reinforce the steel plate. Like, it's not going anywhere. This is the first try. Hopefully it works. We already tested the motor earlier and it was fine. So we're gonna pop this on here and cross our fingers. I'm gonna put my glasses on. Oh, that's amazing. Let's try it again. Now there's nothing inside the engine, obviously, because it wouldn't normally turn over that fast, but that's incredible. It works. It works. It's alive. Yeah, yes. I don't think I can truly explain just how happy I am with how things have worked out. And with just the pilot bushing and balancing the flywheel left to do, we're pretty much done here. Huge thanks again to Scott Costanzo for pioneering this setup, and if you'd like to see what he did, I have linked it down below. The transmission mount is next on the agenda, and like with everything else, it's going to be another case of how hard can it be. So if you haven't yet, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. Huge thanks to our awesome patrons for their continued loyal support. It really is appreciated as we're still waiting for YouTube to realize that this project actually exists. For more content between episodes, make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Fanatic Builds, and please tell some friends about us as it takes seconds and would really help. Till next time, thanks for watching and stay tuned. What? What? And then you just go, yeah.